Continuing our look at binary phase diagrams, we're now going to introduce an element of complexity in that we are going to allow there to be formation of a compound intermediate between A and B. So if we were to look at this phase diagram, this would be representative of a phase diagram where there's one intermediate composition that forms in between the two end members. Now, for all practical purposes, this phase diagram is very much like the phase diagrams that we were looking at in the last lecture. We can think of this as two eutectic phase diagrams that are stacked side by side. So the difference being, yesterday, one end of the eutectic phase diagram was A, and the other end was B. In this phase diagram, let's think about it as a eutectic diagram between phase A and phase AB2. And right next to that, we're going to put a binary phase diagram between phase AB2 and phase B. Okay, so all of the regions now that are shown in white are two phase regions. And you can see with the labels here what phases are present in those regions. A little bit of vocabulary that we need. Notice that the phase AB2, it's a what we would say a line phase, that is, the stoichiometry of that must be fixed at that 1 to 2 ratio of A to B. And if we follow the vertical line upward, it goes all the way up until we hit the liquidus. So that means compound AB2 is a congruently melting compound. When it melts to form a liquid, the composition of the liquid is the same as the composition of the solid. Here's one of many examples of such a phase diagram. This is the phase diagram between manganese 2 oxide and aluminum oxide. And you can see there's only one ternary composition that forms, MnAl2O4. That would be a one-to-one -one ratio of aluminum 2O3 and MnO. Interestingly, on this phase diagram, it doesn't really look like it's at 50%, but let's ignore that for a minute. Now, in these phase diagrams where we have compound formation, we also sometimes encounter a situation where the intermediate compound is not congruently melting. We would say it's incongruently melting. And an incongruently melting compound would be one that when it starts to melt, the composition of the liquid is not the same as the composition of the solid. And we can see that from the phase diagram. What that means is the vertical line that represents that composition does not extend all the way up to the liquidus. So here, if we follow this AB2 line up until we get to a temperature of T2, once we go above T2, the compound starts to melt. And, but what we find in the region above T2 is an equilibrium mixture of B plus uh, a liquid that is richer in A than the AB2 point where we started. Okay, so eventually we get up to the point where there's more and more liquid, and when we cross the liquidus here, now we go back to a homogeneous sample, all liquid of composition AB2. In this kind of a phase diagram, we encounter a new point, which is called a paratectic point, and that would be point P. Now, the thing about the paratectic point is, just like a eutectic point, we have two solid phases and a liquid in equilibrium. But if we look at the composition of the two solid phases, here at this paratectic point, we have an equilibrium between the solid AB2 and the solid B. Right? We have this region where AB2 and the liquid are in equilibrium. We have this region where B and the liquid are in equilibrium. And then we have this region, which is just the liquid. So it's these three phases in equilibrium. But notice that the composition of the paratectic point, here it's about 60% B, is richer in A than either of the two solids that are at equilibrium at this point. Okay, So when we have a paratectic point, that will be a kink in our liquidus rather than a minimum in the liquidus. One of the areas where phase diagrams can be very useful is when we are interested in growing single crystals. 
let's say we're interested in growing single crystals for a diffraction study or maybe for a measurement of some property or maybe just for the application. Well, it's a little bit trickier to grow crystals of an incongruently melting compound than it would be a congruently melting compound. For a congruently melting compound, we just get a liquid that has the desired composition and we cool very slowly. And if we control the nucleation centers and the growth rate, we can obtain single crystals. But if we tried that approach to grow crystals of AB2, you should be able to see that's not going to work. If we were to cool at the composition that was exactly AB2, or for that matter, if we were to cool along this dashed line, what happens when the liquid starts to solidify is we're going to form crystals not of AB2, but of B. That will not be effective uh, as a method of crystal growth. Now, if we were to follow this dashed line down, uh, we're forming more and more crystals of B, and then when we pass this point U, now all of a sudden, the solid that is in equilibrium with the liquid changes composition dramatically. So above U, the solid in equilibrium with the liquid is B, and below U, the solid in equilibrium with the liquid is AB2. And so it's very common when you have this kind of a phase diagram and you were to cool on this vertical line that you might not end up with an equilibrium mixture when you got back to room temperature. And the reason why is because if you don't cool very slowly through this region, there's not enough time, not enough energy for B to transform into AB2. Now, coming back to the question of crystal growth for a minute, what would we do if we wanted to grow crystals of AB2? Is it impossible? It's not impossible. It can oftentimes be feasible to grow crystals of an incongruently melting compound. But the key thing is that when we come out of the pure liquid region, the solid that's in the equilibrium with the liquid must be AB2. So what that means is we need to grow at a composition somewhere between point E, the eutectic, and point P, the paratectic. So if we were to come down here, then when we start to solidify the sample, the crystals that form will be of composition AB2. Now what you would typically do is spend a, a very slow cool in this region where AB2 is in equilibrium with the liquid. And then once you go below the solidus here, then you would want to cool rapidly. You might want to quench from this region where uh, you have AB2 in equilibrium with the liquid. That is, and by quench, I mean cool very rapidly so that we try and quench in the equilibrium situation that was present at the high temperature. Now, if we we're going to talk about realistic phase diagrams, we oftentimes have elements not just of compound formation, but the compounds and the end members can oftentimes form solid solutions, as is shown on this diagram. So not every intermediate composition is going to be a line phase that's just present as a vertical line on the phase diagram. Oftentimes there would be some solid solution that forms around those intermediate compositions. Okay, let's finish this section on binary phase diagrams by looking at a real phase diagram. And I'm going to ask you different questions about interpreting this phase diagram. And if you've got a good grasp on things, I think these questions should be pretty easy. So my first question for you is, in this phase diagram between lead chloride and rubidium chloride, what is the solidus temperature? Remember that the solidus temperature is the temperature below which there are no liquid phases present. So in this uh, phase diagram, conveniently they've put uh, some of the temperatures on here, we can see that the, these lines right here represent the points below which a liquid phase is not present. And the lowest of them is 396 degrees C. So the solidus temperature of this phase diagram is 396 C. All right, next question. On this phase diagram, we can see one, two, three, four, five different ternary phases. Of those five phases, which are congruently melting? Remember that for a congruently melting compound, 
the line that represents that compound will extend all the way up to the liquidus. So we see that there are two congruently melting compounds in this phase diagram. This one, rubidium lead 2 chloride 5, and this one, rubidium lead chloride 3. The other three ternary phases here are all incongruently melting compounds. Okay, I've circled a paratectic point. Tell me which phases are in equilibrium at the paratectic point. Okay, to answer this question, we need to look at the different regions that all meet at the paratectic point. This region up here above the liquidus, that's just the liquid. So the liquid is one of the three phases in equilibrium, and that's always true for a paratectic or eutectic point. Then we have this region, which is an equilibrium between the liquid and pure rubidium chloride. So rubidium chloride is another one of the phases that's in equilibrium at the paratectic point. And then the last region is this region, where the liquid is in equilibrium with this phase, rubidium 2 lead Cl4. Okay, so at the paratectic point, we have an equilibrium between the liquid, rubidium 2 lead Cl4, and rubidium chloride. Which ternary phase do you think would be the easiest to grow crystals of? Well, as a general rule, it's easiest to grow crystals of congruently melting compounds. Uh, we have two congruently melting compounds in this phase diagram, as we've already discussed. Rubidium Pb2Cl5 and rubidium Pb3Cl3. However, the rubidium PbCl3, you can see, is not stable all the way down to room temperature. Right? It's only stable down to about 320 degrees C. So below that temperature, it's going to decompose into other phases. There's really only one phase that would be amenable to pretty straightforward crystal growth, and that would be rubidium Pb2Cl5. Now, that's not to say that it would be impossible to grow crystals of rubidium lead Cl3. You, to do so, you'd want to cool slowly at that 50-50 mixture, and then at some point you'd want to quench rapidly from high temperature. The converse question is, there are some phases on this phase diagram for which I cannot imagine any good way to grow crystals which phases are going to be the most difficult, practically impossible to grow crystals of? All right, so we've already talked about rubidium Pb2Cl5 and rubidium Pb3Cl3. Uh, we haven't talked about the other three ternary phases. I think one of them, it would be possible to grow crystals, and the other two would be very, very difficult. And the reason why I say that is it would be very difficult to grow crystals of any phase that does not have an equilibrium with the liquid. So if we look at the phase diagram here and concentrate on the regions where a solid is in equilibrium with the liquid, I've highlighted those in green here. And what you can see is there are two phases, rubidium-6, lead-5, Cl-16, and rubidium-3, PbCl-5 that do not extend into a region where they're in equilibrium with the liquid. So I don't see how you would grow crystals of those because to do so, would you'd have to rely on a solid, solid phase transformation, which is generally not a great way to get crystals. And then finally, what would happen if we tried to make rubidium lead Cl3 we simply cooled it down from the melt and brought it slowly back to room temperature. This is actually a compound that my group tried to make, and it did not succeed. So the question is, what would you end up with? The phase we're trying to make, rubidium lead Cl3, is stable between 320 degrees C and 440 degrees C. But once we cool below 320 degrees C, it disappears from the phase diagram. So if we were to cool down, say, to something like a point here, then what we would have is we're in a two-phase region. And the two phases that are in equilibrium in that region 
we can determine by drawing horizontal lines until we get to a homogeneous composition. And on the one hand, we have rubidium PB2Cl5. And on the other hand, we have rubidium 6 lead 5 cl 16 Okay, so that's what you would expect if you were to slow cool a one-to-one -one ratio of rubidium chloride and lead chloride. We could, if we wanted to, calculate the phase fraction using the lever rule, um, but you can see that it would be rich in this 6-5-16 composition and relatively little of the 1-2-5 composition. So if we go to make this compound and we get it back down to room temperature and we do our XRD pattern and we analyze the phases present and we find out it's a mixture of these two phases, what it tells us is that the phase we're trying to make is not stable on our phase diagram, at least at room temperature. If you were to do a variable temperature diffraction experiment, you might then learn that the phase is actually stable at these higher temperatures. And so then you'd have a strategy for trying to stabilize it. You could try to quench from those high temperatures. I will tell you that we did try and quench from those high temperatures unsuccessfully. So there was just enough diffusion that when you try and cool rapidly, even from say 350 degrees C, the compound decomposes into these two ternary phases. 